finally, our last little bit of uh, anesthesia we have here. So this is actually, you know, the famous picture of the guy in the ether dome at Mass General Hospital doing the first anesthetic procedure. And this is the patient. I forget the doctor's name. Uh, so this is the actual ether dome. This is Mass General Hospital. I was there. I was lucky enough to do a rotation in their emergency room. This is that picture, the original one. And this is my wife, Becca, as proof that I was actually there. Uh, and this is, they have some mummy. So they have a mummy. This is actually a funny story. So they have this mummy, and the British Museum gave it to them and as a gift for whatever reason, and they keep it in the ether dome. And I was showing Mina this, and Mina is Egyptian, and Mina... <laughs> And he's like, you know, why does Mass Why do they have a mummy? I'm like, oh, the British people, the British people gave him this mummy. And he's like, well, the, why do the British people have it? And the mummy is Egypt's. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, uh, British colonialism taking the mummy out of Egypt. You know, we probably shouldn't have it here. We probably should give it back to the Egyptians. But anyways, and this is just the plaque that, you know, it's a historic landmark because first, uh, the first time of uh, doing anesthesia. So... Uh, I've talked many times in this lecture specifically about how, you know, we're not entirely sure how drugs work. And guess what? We're not entirely sure how general anesthetic or gases work. So there was sort of like a historical progression. At first, we thought it had to do with the lipophilicity of the of the gas. And that was sort of the Meyer-Overton principle. The higher, the more lipophilic a drug a gas was, the more potent it was wasn't always necessarily the case. And then we thought it had to do with ligand-gated potassium channels and how membrane hyperpolarization might have slowed down neuron potential, neuron firing, and that really wasn't entirely right. And so now we're sort of on this idea that it has something to do with the GABA-A receptor inhibiting the chloride current and then, you know, sort of working like a benzo because some of the benzos work like that. But in reality, we don't know how the gases work. So think about that when you're getting your appendix out or your gallbladder out in a few years and you're breathing in the gases and the anesthesiologist and you remember for the pharmacology class that we don't know how this gas works we just know it does work that that doesn't you know freak you out I don't know what does but the two concepts that you should know about the gases are MAC and the blood gas partition coefficient MAC minimum alveolar concentration. So this is the concentration or the percent of the gas in the alveolar space that produces an absence of response in 50% of the patients to noxious stimulants. So think of it like KM. This is how, how, how potent is this gas? What is its MAC? What is its minimal, the minimal concentration we need of it to cause you to fall asleep? And so it, you know, the the, the way it's reported is in 50% of patients, but the, the idea is the lower the MAC, the lower the MAC, the more potent a gas is, the less we can use with greater effect. Boom. So we want a low MAC for high potency. The other thing is uh, the blood gas partition coefficient. So this is how soluble is the gas in blood. So if a blood, if the gas is more soluble in our blood, it's going to take a longer time to redistribute throughout the body, get to the brain, and cause sedation. So if it's more soluble, it's slower. And this is a little tough to understand, but if you think of it like oxygen and CO2, we don't measure oxygen that's a sort of, like, you know, sorry, when it acts and it's effective, it's effective as a gas, not as a dissolved solution. So think of it like this. The gas is dissolving. The gas is getting into your lungs, and then it's getting into the blood. But we want the gas to remain a gas in our blood. We don't want it to dissolve. So if the gas remains as it is, it's going to get to the brain faster. I hope that makes sense. Let me see if I can try to explain a little bit. So if the blood saturates quickly, if the gas is not soluble, so the gas is not soluble in your blood, 
So the blood saturates quickly because it, you know, let's say only 10% of it can be dissolved. The blood gets to 10% very quickly. And so then the partial pressure evenly distributes throughout the body and gets to the brain faster because the gas, it doesn't, it is still filling our lungs. It needs to go somewhere. It dissolves into the blood. So then it just starts spreading through the body quickly. Now, if the blood is very soluble, let's say 50% of it dissolves, it takes a little bit more time to get to that 50%. So it takes a longer time to distribute through the body. So if the blood, if the gas is not able to dissolve in the blood very well, we'll give the arbitrary number of 10%. If it has a low solubility, it's going to work very fast. And then on the flip side, if it has a high solubility in the blood, you know, a lot of it has to dissolve and to saturate and then start spreading throughout the body. So the key concept here is if a blood gas partition coefficient, if we have a gas that is very soluble in our blood, it's going to take a while to dissolve and therefore it will have a slow rate of induction and it'll take a longer time for us to fall asleep. So MAC, just to summarize, MAC is our potency. A lower MAC is a more potent gas. A lower dose causes more people to fall asleep. And then our blood gas partition coefficient, if a gas dissolves quickly, in the, if, if, a, if a gas has a higher solubility, it's going to take a longer time for it to spread throughout the body because it has to dissolve and then it has to spread through each compartment and that will take longer than if a gas has a low solubility then it will quickly you know fill the space that it can or dissolve the amount that it can and then it'll start distributing faster so similarly to uh, the local anesthetic slide you know we'll just going to sort of hit a few of the key points on each of the different halogenated hydrocarbon or gas agents. So we have halothane, isofluorine, and fluorine, sevo, des, sevofluorine, desfluorine, and nitric oxide. For the most part, we only really use sevofluorine and desfluorine anymore. So halothane, historically, halothane, think hepatotoxicity, the H's, can also sensitize your heart muscle to catecholamines and cause arrhythmias. If you're stressing the body with surgery, it can also cause a drop in blood pressure. And fluorine is a proconvulsant. Desfluorine is a can cause some sympathetic stimulation, and it can also air, irritate the airway during induction. Sevofluorine is the most commonly used general anesthetic. It is also a little nephrotoxic. In nitric oxide, we primarily use as an adjuvant agent, and we want to avoid in cardiomyopathy and pulmonary arterial hypertension. So now we'll just finish off with a few of the IV induction agents that we can use. So propofol. Propofol, if you've ever been in the uh, OR, if you've ever had surgery, propofol is that white stuff, that white... Uh, milky solution that they inject which is primarily used for maintenance of anesthesia or in some cases induction it's a GABA A agonist we believe it also has some NMDA antagonism properties uh, so it can be used as an induction agent and a maintenance agent of general anesthesia uh, it is a first and second line IV anesthetic agent so first being you know, you can use it directly to induce sleep in a patient, and you can also use it to maintain sleep. It has rapid onset recovery, and it's also antiemetic. Therefore, you know, it's sort of got a couple of very good things that help us. Um, side effects can cause hypertension and respiratory depression. Uh, so because I, I said it's a milky sort of solution, it literally is white. It looks like milk. It's because it's actually a, uh, an egg solution, I believe. Or a little, if it's not an egg, it's 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 some sort of lipophilic. I, I I forget off the top of my head what it is, but because of that, it's actually very fatty and it can cause uh, hypertriglyceridemia. So you can have patients if they're undergoing 
some sort of, if for whatever reason they're kept on a ventilator and it's decided that they're being sedated with propofol, if you keep them on that for hours and hours and days, you know, you could induce a hypertriglyceridemia and then possibly uh, a, uh, a, a case of uh, pancreatitis. There's also something called a propofol infusion syndrome where you can have a mix of rhabdomyolysis, metabolic acidosis, and renal failure. Etomidate, another possible GABA-A agonist. Not totally sure about that quite yet. And this is primarily used for rapid sequence intubation. So rapid sequence intubation is when there is a case of uh, possible risks for aspiration or just an instance where we need to... Uh, intubate a patient uh, very quickly and uh, it's a part of uh, that protocol primarily it is your sedative uh, it, it has no analgesic effect so when we're thinking about putting somebody down for anesthesia you know we think about something to paralyze you to put you to sleep and then to control pain this does not control for pain. So if somebody's going to be given automidate, we do need to also give them some fentanyl or dilaudid to control for pain going forward. Uh, side effects, minimal cardiovascular and respiratory side effects, nausea and vomiting. Ketamine. Ketamine is an NMDA antagonist. It can be used in alcoholics, procedural sedation, and anesthesia in the OR. So it is in a dissociative anesthesia. So when we say dissociative, that means that is the, you know, you left your body and watched yourself in bed. You sort of have hallucinations and sort of wild dreams. Side effects include catatonia, amnesia, marked analgesia. We have some cardiovascular stimulation. It has very little respiratory depression. And the sort of special thing with ketamine is, as I was sort of uh, providing examples for it, it can cause some post-op illusions and crazy dreams. As Mina had said to me once when he was working at Christ as a pharmacist, when he, he his patients who got ketamine loved him because it made them feel all funky and weird. So we have a barbiturate thiopental, which was one of the original induction agents. So it's a barbiturate, so you can give it as a, a bolus IV dose or an IV drip. And so this is an induction agent to put you to sleep before intubation. It's very rapid onset, 30 seconds, and it's got a short uh, action, only 10 minutes. It's metabolized very slowly, and therefore it uh, produces sort of a hangover effect. Because it's a barbiturate, it does not have any analgesic effect. And, uh, you know, we've talked about barbiturate before, so we have the possibility for respiratory depression and uh, hypotension and decreased uh, cerebral blood flow was one of the main problems that occurred. It's not used so much anymore. So as I talked about, some of these, oh, some of these induction I've intravenous agents and induction agents, they don't have uh, any analgesic effect. And so for that, we use opioids. And so we don't really use morphine because uh, it's not as fast-acting. What we tend to use is fentanyl and so fentanyl for induction and uh, analgesia. Uh, the idea is we have uh, minimal reduction in circulation, meaning minimal drops in blood pressure with fentanyl and so fentanyl. However, you know we're using very potent dosed in the micrograms uh, opioids, so there is the possibility for severe respiratory depression. However, they're hooked up to a ventilator after they've been intubated, so that isn't our problem anymore. Uh, and then finally, midazolam, it's another benzo. We don't really use lorazepam or diazepam for general anesthesia, even though they may say that in your books, it's only midazolam. So this is another induction agent. We'll actually usually give this before somebody comes back into the OR to sort of relax them, because it can also provide some anterior grade amnesia, and it's also a very good angiolytic. Uh, pharmacokinetics is a lot slower onset than barb and so we tend to not use it specifically for the actual induction moment. So we use it as an inductive anesthetic in sort of that whole period of inductive anesthesia. We're preparing, we're quieting you down, we're paralyzing you, then we're putting you to sleep. It's sort of used in that realm, but it's not the 
medication that you give and you fall asleep. Uh, it can prolong recovery because it is, you know, a little bit longer acting. Uh, there's minor respiratory and cardiovascular depression, and it, again, it's not an analgesic. So, sort of just some bringing it sort of all together. If you have a patient who is sort of has mild pain, we want to stick to aspirin, uh, Tylenol, and NSAIDs like ibuprofen and naproxen. I will never say this. You'll never hear me say this, but they may ask you a question and they may ask you about it. And, you know, you you could also say tramadol, but I wouldn't, in the real world, please don't give tramadol for mild pain. It's not just a weak opioid. It's just as strong as the rest of them. It may not work as well, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have the same opioid abuse potentials. If you take nothing away from this lecture, please remember that. Don't let anybody tell you that it's a weak opioid. It may work shitty, but it doesn't mean it can't be abused, just like Vicodin can. Uh, moderate pain will tend to use uh, hydrocodone and Tylenol or oxycodone and Tylenol being uh, Vicodin and Percocet respectively. And then in severe cases, we'll move towards morphine, fentanyl, and uh, methadone. For overdose, we're using naloxone, and for dependence, we're using methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, and we can use benzos and clonidine. Inhaled sedatives, not really going to get into that. I, what I would say for that is uh, memorize some of the um, memorize the side effects I had mentioned and the two concepts, MAC and blood gas partition coefficient, and understand all of those things. We tend to really only use desfluorine and desipofluorine. Uh, some of the intravenous sedatives, we tend to use fentanyl first line, midazolam and propofol come in sort of second, and first they're sort of used interchangeably. Third line is ketamine, and then if needed, we can use barbiturates, parabot sequence, intubation. We want to use atomidate.